and we're set. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're so happy to have you here. My name is Darby Johnson, and I'm honored to serve as the Dean of Arts and Sciences at West Shore Community College. I'll be your moderator for tonight with these fine human beings on this panel. Very excited about it. Um, as West Shore's cultural arts and lecture series, Humankind includes a variety of offerings, such as a panel discussion like tonight's, musical performances, art exhibits, feature films, all focused on a selected topic for that academic year. This year, our topic is movement, which is a subject that impacts all of us in myriad ways as individuals and as community members. Tonight, we're gonna to explore movement through the lens of Mary Daria Russell's historical novel, The Women of the Copper Country, which depicts the 1913 copper strike in Calumet, Michigan, led by Annie Clements, often called America's first or America's Joan of Arc. The novel was chosen as the 2021 2022 Great Michigan Read. This evening's presentation will be a panel discussion led by three West Shore faculty. Dr. Sonia Seward is professor of chemistry and geology and serves as the chair of the science division. She earned her bachelor's degree at St. Olaf College in Minnesota and her PhD from Montana State University. Mike Nagel is professor of history and political science and serves as the chair of the social sciences division. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees at Western Washington University. Sean Henney is professor of English and education. He earned his bachelor's degree at Lawrence University and his master's degree at Boston College. Our format for tonight will be each of the panelists providing a short presentation of 12 to 15 minutes, which should leave us plenty of time at the end for some questions and answers. If you do have questions, please post them in the chat box and we'll address as many of them as we are able to following the panelists' presentations. So without further ado, let's begin our journey to Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula to the copper mines of Calumet County with our first panelist, Dr. Sonia Seward. Dr. Seward, the floor is yours. Okay, you need to quit sharing though. <laughs> there we go. And I have to switch that too. <laughs> um. I love it when things are different than, there we go. <laughs> so the question I came up with today for this um, session is why is there copper in the Keweenaw Peninsula? Why don't we have mines for copper down here in the lower peninsula? So what we're talking about, here's the lower peninsula of Michigan and this small part here is the only place where copper is found. This is a picture of some copper in the background and it's often found in my geology students have a test that's due tomorrow <laughs> and recognizing the white crystals, I would expect you to know that's either quartz or calcite from limestone, but you'd have to do a few more tests on that to ensure. One of the big things about what makes Michigan's copper unique, it's classified as native copper meaning it comes in a fairly pure form, sort of like if you have a penny from before 1983, it was 100% pure copper. Now it's 3% copper on the outside and cheaper zinc in the inside. Um, so one of the key things is it all comes down to economics, why there's no longer a lot of mining taking place right now. The green color on the outside, that's the oxidized version of copper, meaning Cu, is attracting oxygen from the air we have. Uh, what we have here are some other versions of copper. Um, you know, some of these fancy names, emigaloidal basalt. That is a big part of why we have copper in the Keweenaw Peninsula. Basalt is an igneous rock, meaning it was formed from magma or lava. And it's well over a billion years old. We'll talk a little bit more about why it's there. You can see there's been some, some pure um, impurities in these, but this is very common on how it was mined um, back in, you know, in 1913, when this book took place, which is 
the mines were able to do what is called stamping to get out the pure copper, literally meaning they bring up the copper from down below and just start hitting it with mega sized industrial hammers <laughs> to break, get the pure copper out. And then the rest of the material is, was actually dumped in the lake and that's causing a small issue <laughs> now. Um, Copper's been up in the UP for many years, Native American uses of copper. These are some um, finds um, and Native Americans from 4,000 to 1,000 years ago. Uh, the explorers, particularly the French, um, were trying to figure out where are they getting all this copper with this? And in 1669, and I thought, Mr. Nagel here that I was fascinated by this part because um, the French sent Louis Joliet to search for copper deposits in the area, but instead he decided to join Father Marquette to go find the Mississippi River. And of course, one of Father Marquette's burial grounds is here in the Ludington area. There's another one up on the UP. <laughs> so there's very common, um, very famous at that time. Michigan's waiting to get this piece of copper back. It's called the Antonagon Boulder, um, weighs 3,708 pounds. It was found along a river up in the UP in 1770 and many people try to move it. Um, the War Department, which is federal government back in 1843 seized this and it was when the Smithsonian Institution came about, it's now, and I've seen this at the entrance to the Museum of Natural History, but it's something I was looking at many research sites on this, and there's many who feel this should come back to the state of Michigan. Our first state geologist, um, Douglas Houghton, um, he was the one who actually did research up in the UP and found the iron and copper mines. Um, 1841, he reported to the state government about these fines of iron and copper. Unfortunately, within just a couple of years, he died up in the UP in Lake Superior, which is known for its incredible storms. That led to a rush of finding the mother load. The mother load term started with, how am I going to get rich from this? But it's actually based on what is called the lodestone, which is not copper, but iron, and it's magnetic. And that is, they knew if, you know, this um, place that has never been uh, looked at before for making a lot of money was suddenly, it's time to get my share. But we now know what has happened with the Baron Kings, the big, you know, the ones who are in charge of the industry with this. What makes the UP Keweenaw Peninsula unique from how I'm going to end this is it's known for deep mining, tunnels, shaft mines. We're talking hundreds to thousands and thousands of feet deep. I will admit I've spent way too many hours the past couple of days up at the Michigan Tech University sites. Um, they have the Seaman Museum up there with some incredible finds. And this picture on the left there shows, unfortunately, what can happen, which is a collapse of mine shafts over on the left-hand side. And then um, pictures of the miners. You know, it's the true stories how you got absolutely filthy working down and they probably had their pasties in the bucket, um, which are still pretty tasty for up there. Um, the tunnels. Even though the center of the Keweenaw Peninsula is where the majority of the copper is, um, the mine shafts were long enough that they actually tunneled underneath Lake Superior um, by hundreds of feet. And one of the things in the book was about the pumps that need to be operated. I personally could not ever imagine crawling into that tunnel there with a few wooden beams, and we'll talk more about the pressure of this, but it's just an amazing amount of, oh, you know, I couldn't imagine having 5,000 feet 
above you and knowing that collapses and things have. Here you can see some of the miners working in the shafts, mile deep, 28 to 73 degrees angles here. So we're talking really, really steep. And the bottom of a shaft, it might be 9,600 feet, which is almost two miles. And they had to get down there. And the risk of all the collapse was just, you can see on this picture here, the pressure of the wooden beams that were down there um, were starting to collapse, yet they're working there. Um, here's some other mines, miners working on the tailings, um, some amazing crystals. Actually, it was last summer I managed to go up to the UP Houghton in the, that area and see some of this, but the, I found this picture here, 1905, and they're loading um, copper ingots, the basically copper bricks to bring to the East Coast. And I just clicked on a picture rather than, <laughs> there we go. Uh, I didn't make it so that I could go to the next slide very easy. I apologize for that. Let me get up here. There we go. Um, so trying to keep this 12, 15 minutes here. Precambrian means anything older than 545 million years ago. That's still really young geologically because the earth is about 4.6 billion years. The studies that have been done for this are estimating that the copper um, is approximately a billion years old. Um, I have seen more detailed like 1.10 billion based on isotopic ratios, but it comes from volcanic basaltic lava flows. That's part of it. And you can see the darker colors in this picture here. For those of in my geology right now, we've been talking about mafic basaltic minerals, which have a lot of iron and um, magnesium, but also copper and other minerals in it. And also sedimentary in origin. It turned out what happened is the water in this area was superheated by magma, heated up to over 200 degrees Celsius, and some of the copper actually dissolved into the solution. And then eventually, um, as the water cooled, if you're, you know, you know that you can get more sugar into hot tea than into iced tea. Same idea here. It settles out as the water cooled down and the magma dissipated here. Um, there was silver up there. Um, that's like the magic find is to find the silver, but there's not enough to keep it. Um, the mining operations going for what is actually available. Isle Royale, the island to the northwest of um, the Keweenaw Peninsula has a lot of this copper conglomerate. I don't even know if I'll be able to show this piece because it looks just like the behind the scene here. Um, this piece of copper conglomerate I have was taken from one of the last mines in 1964. I have no idea who donated this to the college before my time, but conglomerate means particles rounded by water and then cemented together. So that is how that actually formed. Now we could get into detail if you had many, many uh, geology classes, but <laughs> basically magma rose, there's a lot of copper in it. And that's where we went from there. Um, you can see here where the copper actually is going down the middle of the Keweenaw Peninsula, but it does go underneath as you can see in this version of the <clears throat> Keweenaw Peninsula. One of the things that is in the book that was talked about was all the beautiful sandstone buildings in Calumet. And it turns out that the top layer um, are two types of sandstone. So those were sedimentary laid down um, millions and millions of years after the copper was 
So they had to go below that. So how I wanna end is go to modern times. Arizona, since the 1960s, now produces 65% of the copper that the United States uses. I was, um, oops, the symbol of the state of Arizona is cattle, cotton, citrus, climate, and copper. That's what the five C's are. The, there's currently 10 major copper mines. I mean, 632 million pounds of copper a year. Think of all the copper wiring we have in our buildings. I mean, everywhere, it's just amazing. But there are major issues occurring right now. Um, there's two proposed major mines that are on Native American grounds. And a big reason that the copper in Arizona is so much cheaper is UP, it was tunneled. This is the Mission Mine. Um, it's all open pit mining down there. And so there's both a lot of issues with water quality for what water there is in Arizona, um, the open pit environmental issues. So I hope you've gained a little bit of interest in copper and why it's important back in the UP and why it's important now. Thank you so much, Dr. Seaworth. That was really informative and interesting. Gives us a great context to continue talking about the novel. Next up, we have Professor Nagel, who's going to talk about some of the real people who inspired the novel, um, The Women of the Copper Country. I'm, uh, I lost my, I have my, um, uh, uh, my things moved around on me. Okay. Uh, well, I really appreciate being part of this panel. Um, I was very interested in this book when I first heard about it, um, and uh, it also includes one of my favorite genres. I, uh, I teach history, and so I really like reading um, uh, in my, uh, you know, off seasons and that, I like reading historical fiction. Uh, and I also like to use it in class because a lot of times historical fiction does a great job of telling a story, and I think the best history uh, does a good job of telling the story. But when I do read um, historical fiction, uh, I like to make sure that it's good. Uh, and Mary Doria Russell has a blog. And one of the questions that she has there is, um, if you've got a historical novel, uh, are alternative facts allowed? Uh, and she says, basically, she tries to stick to the facts as, as much as she can, especially if she's using people's real names. Um, and she does, and, and in her book, she does create some fictional characters. Uh, Ava is the best example. She also combines a couple of people. So like um, uh, Mike Sweeney uh, is actually uh, a combination of a couple of different characters, but she's basing them on, um, basing events on, on actual things that could have happened. Uh, and she does a pretty good job, I think, of focusing on the actual historical events. Um, on the right, uh, we see a headline from the Calumet News. And by the way, if you're interested in finding some of those um, actual news stories, the Calumet News uh, is actually available for free at, on a website called Chronicling America. Um, the book does a really good job of focusing on the grassroots nature of this strike uh, and the involvement of women. The one-man drill was an important uh, issue. Uh, it does a nice job with the Italian Hall um, tragedy. And so I think it's good historical fiction. So as I'm trying to address kind of a, a fact versus fiction with this book, there are kind of three areas that I'd really like to focus on. Uh, one of the things that really drew me to this, and you know, in addition to the fact that it's, I think it's well written and that, uh, and the history is good, is um, the immigrant experience. And so I'd like to talk about immigration uh, and issues of immigration um, in that era. Uh, and then we'll look at the historical figures of James McNaughton and Big Annie or Annie Clements. So. The book focuses a lot and, and demonstrates for us that many immigrants were the ones who were actually working in the line, in the mines. Um, and so uh, uh, there were immigrants from all over, primarily Europe, uh, but different parts of Europe. The era of uh, from um, 1890 to 1920 saw a dramatic increase in the number of immigrants coming to the United States. Just some statistics. 
between 1860 and 1890, so the 30 years prior to that, 1860 to 1890, there were 10 million immigrants that came to the United States. In that second era, 1890 to 1920, 18 million immigrants came to the United States, almost twice as many. There were so many immigrants coming to the United States that a brand new facility had to be created called Ellis Island. It opened in 1892. And on the right, you see you know, the, the image of the Statue of Liberty welcoming immigrants to the United States. And it was such an important figure because um, that was one of the first things that many of those immigrants would see. One thing that's interesting about the large numbers of immigrants is that many so-called new immigrants were coming to the United States at that time. Um, the, and when I say new immigrants, I don't just mean newly arrived, but there was actually some, some different traits to some of these immigrants. Here we see a chart that identifies the so-called changing face of American immigration. If you notice, okay, so I, I think you can see my cursor. So in this era, you know, uh, 1865 to 1880, um, there were so-called, many so-called old immigrants coming to the United States. These were people from Northern and Western Europe, uh, Germany, France, uh, England, Scotland, Wales, okay? many Irish uh, as well. Um, but if you notice beginning particularly by the 1890s and then really skyrocketing in the early 1900s, many so-called new immigrants were arriving in the United States. Many of these were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. So those so-called old immigrants, well, they tended to be white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant in their faith, wasps. Many of these new immigrants, from Eastern Europe, you know, maybe there were uh, there were larger numbers of uh, Jewish immigrants. Uh, many coming from Italy were Roman Catholic, uh, and so they didn't assimilate as quickly as others. Uh, and in fact, they faced an awful lot of criticism in many cases. Um, and uh, we can see that in 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 the book, but as well as American society in that era. I'll come back to that here in just a second. But you see that changing uh, nature. Where were these immigrants coming to? Well, I really like this map. Um, this identifies the number of foreign born Americans uh, in the United States in 1910. Uh, the areas that are yellow on this map are, are, are counties where less than 5% of the people in those areas were, um, uh, were either, uh, were uh, less than 5% were immigrants or at their parents were immigrants, less than 5%. The green and the blue areas of this map identify areas where large numbers of immigrants, 50 to 75%, even over 75% of the residents in those blue and green areas um, were from, uh, either they were from, or they were immigrants themselves or their parents were immigrants. So I wanna go like this, give a highlight here. Notice Michigan, but particularly Western Michigan and the UP. 75% of the people in that area were either born outside of the United States or they had at least one parent born outside of the United States. Um, I love this map uh, because um, it, it just demonstrates uh, that the United States is a nation of immigrants uh, and where many of those immigrants particularly those coming from Europe in that era, uh, where they were moving to. Um, so I'll go back to this. Um, so how were those immigrants treated in the United States? Well, often not very well. Um, if I just go to the first one on the right here, okay? Mine, uh, if you, this is an advertisement trying to get people to work in the mines. And if you notice, hey, mine workers, this is this is for coal industry, but I'm just trying to demonstrate the um, uh, status of the United States in this era. Um, it says, hey, if you're familiar with coal mines, we need some workers. And it says no colored applicants or Italians. Many Italians and many Greeks were actually cons not considered to be Caucasian in that era. Uh, on the left, you see a, a, a political cartoon from 1903. The and um, would it be easier if I went in closer on this, or can you see it okay? What do you What do you think, Sean? You don't have your you're not muted. Is this okay? Or 
It looks good to me, man. Okay, all right. So on the right, you see rats with very dark skin coming into the country. Uh, and they've got things on them that say things like mafia um, and um, uh, they're uh, anarchists and that. And here, um, Uncle Sam isn't looking too happy that these immigrants are coming into the United States. And the, the figure on the cloud here um, on the left, that's William McKinley, who was assassinated, um, who, was, who was a president who was assassinated and he was assassinated by an anarchist. And so many people blamed these immigrants and labeled them anarchists as they were coming to the United States. This attitude uh, is reflected um, in the um, uh, beliefs of Mr. McNaughton. So how does um, Mary uh, Doria Russell present um, uh, James McNaughton? Well, um, he's got some very iron habits uh, and that's the quote that she uses. Uh, we're introduced to him in, in, with his morning, morning ritual where he has everything timed out uh, the way he wants it to be. He follows a very scientific industrial management style. Uh, he ends up giving, what was it, a nickel um, a raise to uh, his maid because she was so perfect uh, in getting his oatmeal at the right temperature. He's in the shower for a certain amount of time. He has his newspapers ironed. I mean, he's got these rituals in the mornings that are important to him. By the way, I, and you know, if you've read the book, uh, he gave um, uh, this nickel raise uh, and she didn't get another raise for what? Was it 10 or 12 years or something like that? Um, he is alarmed at his word, the degradation of the labor force because so many immigrants were coming to the United States. He describes them as anarchists and Marxists. And he's very concerned over their union organizing because he wants to have as much control over the labor force as possible. He doesn't want anyone dictating to him what their conditions should be like. Uh, he wants to cut costs as easily uh, and, um, as possible. That's how um, uh, the author uh, portrays him. Well, what was he really like? Okay. Uh, he, has a, uh, he had an engineering degree uh, from the University of Michigan, and he was first hired at uh, Calumet and Hecla uh, in 1901. Uh, so he's, he's been there for a while, uh, you know, for when the book takes place. Uh, and he was um, 37 years old when he was first hired uh, at CNH. Uh, he was consistently cutting costs. And in fact, um, he was able to cut costs nearly in half uh, within a few years after taking over uh, as the manager. And you see one of his direct quotes there uh, that demonstrates his attitude toward, um, uh, toward um, uh, um, unions. He wants to maintain total control. Uh, and uh, uh, he was willing to hire spies, hire scabs, over 900 scabs. He supported intimidation and a range of other tactics in order to control the unions. Um, he uh, also um, uh, was very close with uh, law enforcement. Um, and, you know, he's got them in his pocket, so to speak. Uh, he's very close with uh, um, uh, the, uh, 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 the judges and things like that, because uh, if he has to use their help, uh, he's going to use any help that he can. And he's not um, uh, afraid to, to uh, hire strike, break, strike breakers, scabs, use intimidation and violence as much as possible, and to control the media. Um, I had hoped that his uh, home was still there. Um, it's not. Um, but his summer cottage is. Uh, and so you can stay there on Airbnb if you like. How about Annie? Okay, so Annie is from um, uh, a mining family. She's, she is very tall. She's very charismatic. Uh, what was it? At the age of six, she knew how to make pasties, uh, and she could do it in her sleep. If James McNaughton is very controlling in his morning, she's um, there. Um, she has to go to an outhouse to go to the bathroom. Uh, she's wondering when her husband will come home, if he will come home. Um, she's wondering if he does come home a little late, is that because he's drunk? Uh, is that because there's been a, um, uh, a death in the mines? And she really was the head of the women's auxiliary and she led those parades. Here we see an actual photo of her holding that big, huge flag. And you can see um, that she's pretty tall. Uh, she's over six feet tall. 
Um, and that flag is also really huge. Um, in reality, okay, the real Annie, she was born in, in Calumet. Uh, what's interesting is when she was young, uh, she went back to Slovenia and she lived there for five or for six or seven years, something like that. And this helped to strengthen her um, uh, connection to the Slovenian community. She was abused by her first husband, Joseph, um, and uh, he was a minor. Uh, he was very quiet. Um, um, I don't know if, if he was a member of the union or not. Uh, the, you know, I don't know if she took liberty with that um, or not. Um, here we see Big Annie uh, on the left with a group. And if you notice, here's one of the um, National Guard members in the back. Uh, and here you see her, she, as I say, she was very charismatic uh, and, and she worked with a lot of the, the women. Um, she was devastated by the Italian Hall Massacre and the failure of the strike. Uh, for a short time, she did uh, raise money for survivors. Uh, and on the right, uh, we see Ella Bloor, who, who's another character that comes up in the book, who's a real person. Uh, Annie did leave Calumet. She went to, to Chicago. She left her husband. Um, and then she married uh, a journalist, not a photographer, but a journalist named Frank Shaws. Um, and they had a daughter. They were together for a short time, but he was a heavy drinker and he was abusive. So she divorced him. Uh, she ended up marrying again, but that marriage also ended in divorce. As the author put it in, a, in, a, um, uh, in an interview, she was a bad picker, do I dare say, of husbands. Um, she worked as a milliner um, making women's hats, uh, and she died of cancer uh, at the age of 68. She never spoke about the tragedy again, and part of her died, even though she survived, part of her died um, really with that. And so um, I think I went over just a little bit, but I just wanted to touch on some of the facts and the fiction associated with the book. I will stop sharing now um, and um, I'll look forward to some questions uh, and further discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Nagel. Up next, we have Professor Henney, who's gonna talk about the power of literary art to communicate history in, to an audience from this book. Take it away. Thanks, Darby. Um, Mostly, I'm just feeling grateful because I get to hang out with these people all the time, right? You, I'm so always impressed by my colleagues and what they know and what they can do and their research methods. And so I'm kind of tagging along on the coattails a little bit here. But what I wanted to do was mostly pick up on some of the stuff Mike was saying about Annie, um, because there's way too much book here for us to be able to think about how Mary Dory Russell did the whole book. Um, but I can help you understand a little bit about how she created the character of Annie the literary character, not the historical character that Mike was talking about. And, and Sonia gave me this lovely metaphor um, because I think part of the project is rescuing Annie, the way that the state of Michigan is trying to rescue that noggin boulder from the Smithsonian. You know, how do you get back at something that matters a lot to you? And um, it's fascinating having taught this book. Now, most of my students have finished reading it and finished discussing it that few, if any of them, had actually heard of Annie at all. And so Mary's project of trying to figure out how to make that woman's um, mission and her, her, uh, the power of her accessible to an audience is a really cool and powerful thing. So how do you, how do you create a character? Um, so a couple of things that, that occur to me. One is that to, to, to take a look at what she did with the Jonah Arc reference. So that was actually a reference that was made by a journalist um, early in the strike process who, who compared her to Joan of Arc. And so Mary seized on that and did all kinds of really cool and interesting things with it. The, if you've read the book, you know that the prologue features a vision. Um, there's, a, there's a moment at which um, Annie is taken aloft in, an, in a balloon and uses that inspiration or the vision of that to kind of inspire her through the rest of the novel. Um, that's a Joan of Arc reference. There's a, a Joan of Arc was, the, was a, a medieval um, person who turned the fortunes of the French around in the Hundred Years' War because she had a vision, because she was committed to her vision, and because she therefore turned the tide of battle in a, in a way that women weren't expected to at all. In fact, my daughter told me today she was learning about Joan of Arc, and she was flabbergasted that Joan of Arc was the only woman that was mentioned in the chapter um, that Joan shows up in. So one way that, that Mary builds the character of Annie is by using this Joan of Arc image, and she holds it in front of us as we read through the rest of the, of the story. There's even a moment where Ava, the character Ava, prays specifically to St. Catherine because that is the saint that um, Joan of Arc also prayed to. You know, making the, as many times as Mary can, she makes that connection or that association. 
Another way we learn about characters, and this is maybe one of the reasons why Mary chose to write the novel um, in this postmodern way, where there are multiple shifting points of view. So you not, don't always stay, obviously, in McNaughton's head or in Annie's, but you get to experience the way other characters think, and that means you get to see what they think about Annie. Um, so, for example, uh, Mike showed that image of the way that too many people thought about immigrants and thinking about them as less than human. That thought actually occurs to James McNaughton's wife in the novel, who, re who thinks of Annie as unnatural and less than human in a, in a moment of, of frustration that she expresses to her husband. Charlie Miller um, is a composite character. Mike said there's a bunch of composite characters in the story. One of them is the union leader, Charlie Miller. There's a fascinating moment at the end of this moment where Annie gives a speech to the woman's auxiliary that Charlie Miller was supposed to give, but Annie kind of takes over that moment. And Charlie, up until that point, thought he had to confront Annie because Annie was trying to um, get involved in the strike or create the strike, and Charlie didn't think it was appropriate or timely for the union to strike. And he wanted to confront her on that, but after that moment, her intensity and the power of her speech, he backs down. The last line of that chapter is beautiful. It's something I can't remember exactly, but it's something along the lines of he decided to wait till another day. <laughs> um, so his reaction to the power of Annie, like we get to experience that from Charlie's point of view, and that builds up the strength and the power of, of Annie. One of the most touching moments is when Mother Jones shows up. She's a labor organizer. She gives a rousing speech, too. Um, there's two chapters back to back, one in which Mother Jones gives this incredibly powerful speech. But then afterwards, she goes into the kitchen where Annie is and tries to explain to Annie that the strike's going to fail and has the um, respect for Annie to bring that to her attention, um, to trust her with that with that information. We see that the major labor leader, Mother Jones, right, this towering woman who's a very diminutive person in stature compared to Annie, but in the, in the union labor movement, she was amazing, right? And she trusts Annie with this really important information that of all of the strikes I've been, I know this one's not going to work and tells her that she needs to prepare for, for that reality. But the most important person that we learn about Annie from is, is Ava. Um, students of mine, we, we had several interesting discussions about why Annie doesn't figure prominently into the end of the book. Like, why did she disappear? Where did she go? Like, the, the, the story feels unfinished or something unsatisfying because we learn to love Annie and care about her as readers as we're reading the book. But then she's gone. And where did she go? Well, where she went is into the character of Ava. Obviously, Annie has a significant impact on Ava. Ava's last line of the book is, I will carry the flag for you. This idea that um, these towering figures have inspira inspiration on the rest of us, that's a that's an important historical thing, right? So, you know, if anybody takes Mike Nagel's class, history often is one giant person to another giant person to another giant person. But millions of other people lived and, and did things and accomplished things that we don't hear and see about. And so the cool thing that happens at the end of this book is that uh, Mary Doy Russell collapses the Annie experience, the way we focus on heroes only in history, into the idea that those heroes can inspire the rest of us to do amazing things. So it's a beautiful moment when we learn about Annie through Ava. Another way to do it is through epigraphs. I had a really a couple of interesting conversations with my students about epigraphs in this book. Uh, what I mean is there are moments where an author will use another author's words to set up a chapter or set up the book itself and to help us to see or think things about character through using the epigraphs. That The whole entire book has an epigraph from the book of Matthew from the Bible. And it, and it says, um, the laborer is worthy of his wage. And it's a really fascinating choice by Mary Russell. That's how she says, hey, look through that, that phrase and you can see my book. Okay. Well, that moment in Matthew comes when Jesus is um, commissioning his 12 disciples. He's sending them forth to do, the, to do his work for him because he knows he's not going to live past this, the moment where, he's, where, he's, where he is, at least on earth he isn't. Um, but he tells them that they should not bring with them anything, um, extra food, any kind of money, because their, their labor is going to bring them what they need. In other words, people will take care of them because of the message that they're bringing, right? So that's the signal or that's the sign that, that Mary uses at the beginning is this kind of camaraderie thing, of solidarity among people, that we will care for each other if we care, if we care for each other in an adequate way. Um, that's how she wants us to see the novel. And then all through the novel, there are moments where there are um, connections between socialism and, and Christianity. Like what are the intersections between the solidarity of a socialist movement and the way that Christians are called to care for each other. And that's the lens that she uses then, not just to see the book, but to see Annie. And that's an epigraph that, that does that. 
the other epigraphs that are used every single freaking chapter, and this is a thing of beauty on her part, right, is the choice to use Romeo and Juliet as a way to introduce people um, to the, what's going to happen in the text. Like, how can we see through Romeo and Juliet? So I could pick any of them because they're all wonderful and they're crazy cool. And you don't have to read the book and pay attention to the epigraphs, but you can. And if you track them down, you'll learn all kinds of cool stuff. But there's one at the beginning of a chapter that matters a lot to me. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a moment from Romeo and Juliet when Romeo goes to the ball and he's convinced to finally go there because this woman that he's been lusting after is going to be there. But he sees Juliet and he forgets about this other lady. He forgets everything. And the, the line is, um, she doth teach the torches to burn. She doth teach the torches to burn. That She burns brighter than the torches, right? That's the line that Annie uses to open a chapter. And what happens in that chapter is Michael Sweeney is thinking about how to take photographs of Annie, okay? So what we get in Romeo and Juliet is you get Romeo um, constructing poetry that's his way of thinking about how he sees um, Juliet and then you get Michael Sweeney in his art form which is photography thinking about how he's going to show images of Annie and that's the way Mary wants us to see that chapter right let's look at the chapter through the lens of how Romeo saw Juliet and that's how Michael Sweeney I got to read this part to you I think I have time yeah I do because <laughs> this is just amazing this this moment where Michael Sweeney is looking at at her let me make sure I get the chat, the page right. It's uh, 87. If you guys have it, you can take a look at it. It's, uh, it the, the chapter is, this, is the second chapter of the August 1913 section of the book. And uh, this is Michael Sweeney now. You, you have Annie um, comes into the room. It says, she can feel his eyes on her, taking in the lines of her face, the curve of her cheeks, the light and shadow, the background. Ordinarily, she would never stay in the office by herself. Like any good woman, she is careful about her behavior with men. Scabs are calling her the union's whore, and she does not wish to provide anything that might be used against her or the woman's auxiliary. Even so, with Joe's drinking, it's better to stay out of his sight. She can feel his eyes on her, taking in the lines of her face, the curve of her cheeks, the light and shadow, the background. Okay, so clearly he's looking at her, thinking about how he's going to take the photograph that's going to influence the social justice of the people of the United States towards the, the, um, the, the folks in, in, the, in the copper country. So he sees her as an artist and as a photographer and as a journalist, but you can't just do that. She can feel his eyes on her, taking in the lines of her face, the curve of her cheeks. He's as much a lover in that moment as he is an artist, the same way that Romeo looking at Juliet is as much in that moment the poet, because that whole, the whole speech of Romeo is his line couplets. It's all poetry, right, when, when you look at that scene. So Sweeney looking at, at, at Annie, and he hasn't learned how to love her effectively yet. He will. There's a, there's a real um, loving relationship that develops there. But the artist in him and the lover in him sees her in a particular way, and Mary teaches us how to, be, how to see that with the epigraph, with the power of the epigraph there. So, I, you know, it's a, not the only one. It happens all over the place. The relationship between art and activism. Michael Sweeney does his art because he's using his art to try to inspire social justice. Um, he uses Annie in that particular way, but it doesn't feel like he's exploiting her. It feels like he's doing this as a partnership with her, as you'll see, you know, later on in the book. The, the, that line is not, I'm not done with it yet, that, that line about the torches, because in the rest of that chapter, what we learn is about is why Michael got into photography in the first place. Um, and so you learn that he had um, encountered Jacob Reese when Jacob Reese was taking photographs of um, children in, in New York to try to inspire people to care about people who are less fortunate than themselves. And he describes it this way. Um, he says, I never forgot the man with the camera back in the city, that big bang and the flash and the way dark alleys lit up for one blinding moment. So Michael's life, right, the torch that burns is this moment where um, in his past, he saw that flash go off in the alley and that lit up his vocation for him, it lit off the whole pathway of his life. But who burns brighter than that, right? He sees Annie and she's burning brighter than that moment in his life where he discovered what his purpose in life was, right? So you find out that we can learn about characters through all kinds of things. You learn, like Mary Doria Russell learned about Annie from reading about the historical Annie that Mike taught you about. But then she constructed Annie out of the way other characters see her. She constructs her about, she helps us to see her through the epigraphs. She uses the Michael Sweeney gaze thing to help us to see her. Not done yet though. 
one more really cool piece. And I know I'm going to go over, but it's okay because you got to hear this song. <laughs> so there's this guy named Joe Hill. And Joe Hill was a, um, a labor activist, right? So he was um, really into the industrial workers of the world. This was a labor union that Mother Jones inspired, right? She was an organizer that led the Mother Jones, Mother Jones started the industrial workers of the world. But Joe Hill was also a songwriter. And so he was kind of the soundtrack of the labor movement um, in that time period. And so the union strikers would sing Joe Hill songs um, to kind of inspire them and to, and to focus their optimistic energy. He, he was clever as hell when he did this because he, he based all of his music on existing hymns. So people already knew the hymns, right? And so they knew the music and all they had to do was learn his words. There's a really cool moment in the book where Ava, so Annie's being persecuted, not persecuted. She's being challenged by a reporter um, about her childless status. And the way that Ava rescues her is by singing a Joe Hill song. Like she gets all of the people to sing so loudly that the man, he can't hear the question, the, 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 the interview goes to heck. But it's Ava sees that as a transformative moment where she becomes mature and she's learned how to be a person um, who takes risks like that. Anyway, the song I'm going to sing is a song called The Rebel Girl. And the children in the Women of Copper Country sing this to Annie in the party that celebrates her being released from prison. Like Ava throws this party for her, right? The, the song they sing is this Joe Hill song called The Rebel Girl. Joe Hill wrote this song when he himself was in prison. He was, at least as far as I can tell, falsely accused of a murder, and he eventually was executed for that murder. So he's in death row in a prison looking for inspiration, and he wrote this song called The Rebel Girl. He actually wrote it about a woman named Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who was another woman labor activist um, who started the um, American Civil Liberties Union, another towering woman. Like There's all these towering women in this book, right? But when Mary uses this song, she uses it to help you think about the power of Annie. And so, so if you listen to it, you'll hear um, Joe's looking for inspiration. How do you find inspiration? You'll find a little bit of Annie in this song. So here's, it's called Rebel Girl. There are women of many descriptions In this queer world as everyone knows some are living in beautiful mansions and wearing the finest of clothes. There are blue-blooded queens and princesses who have charms made of diamonds and pearls. But the only and thoroughbred lady is the rebel girl. Here's the chorus, which you guys can all sing. That's the rebel girl. That's the rebel girl. To the working class, she's a precious pearl. She brings courage, pride, and joy to the fighting rebel boy. We've had girls before, but we need some more in this industrial workers of the world. For it's great to fight for freedom with a rebel girl. Now we're going to take it to McNaughton. Hands may be hardened from labor, and her dress may be not very fine. But her heart in her bosom is beaten, that is true to her class and her kind. And those grafters in terror are trembling, when her spite and defiance she'll hurl. For the only and thoroughbred lady is our rebel girl. That's the rebel girl, that's the rebel girl To the working class, she's a precious pearl She brings courage, pride, and joy To the fighting rebel boy We've had girls before, but we need some more In the industrial workers of the world For it's great to fight for freedom With the rebel girl there you go. Thanks to Joe. <clears throat> That's what I've got there, Gabby. Wow, what a treat. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the panelists. I'm completely blown away. Having the opportunity to talk about a literary work and hear it from so many angles is such a joy. Um, thank you all. So we'd like to hear from the audience. What questions do you have? Would you please put your questions in the chat box? What would you like to learn more about? What burning questions do you have? Mm 
do you want to ask a question, Sean? You're muted. I, I was waving. There's people. There are people oh, okay. here. It's exciting. <laughs> I just want to say, Sean, that was awesome. That was so, so cool. This is why I love these events where we get to hear from the geology of, of this. And, you know, I don't have a background in that. I took a geology class when, you know, when I was an undergrad, uh, but learning about, um, uh, you know, how that copper came to be there and the literary analysis, as well as the singing. Oh, man, that, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. All right, we have one here. Um, one of our participants would like to know how young students reacted to this book. Sean, you want to take that one? Yeah, so um, I actually, so I've done this quite often. I, I teach the Great Michigan Read Book um, every time it is there because I'm actually on the committee that, that chooses the book and it matters to me that we have these conversations. And I always wonder that same question, like am I gonna have to do a lot of work to get students invested in it? And I didn't have to work that hard this time. Um, I think it's because the, you know, people, people are initially, my students were initially, it bothered the, cra the heck out of them, um, the Ava-Jack uh, relationship early on. And so it's kind of like that was the gateway drug. <laughs> you know, if you, if you care about that, if you're interested in that, if you're worried about Ava, then you follow that into the other you know, larger issues that the story has. Um, and, and they really did come, come to care about the, the labor issues um, in meaningful ways. And we had some, some fantastic discussions. So in, in my, um, um, my classes, they also wrote um, reader response essays, which is a personal response. They had to find personal intersections or ways in to understanding a novel. And those were beautiful papers. You know, because they all did have eventually figured out ways that the, the book did intersect with their own experience um, in meaningful ways. So it was a it was a positive thing for, for my group. But my students also read the book, and um, I think you know if you if you had uh, if you're studying mining, generally speaking, just about anything that's written about it is from the perspective of the miners, and and that's good. You know, uh, and miners overwhelmingly, whether they, if they were coal miners, silver, copper, whatever, they were male. And so one thinks that, oh, well, this is a, going to be a book about men. But, but what often is the story that's left out is that, okay, maybe men were the ones who were underground, but they had wives who were also impacted by their job, um, you know, their work uh, habits and that, uh, the fact that they may die. Uh, they had sons, uh, they had brothers, they had fathers. And so we see the full impact of this, uh, you know, like Ava, um, Ava's an orphan because dad died in the mines, mom and sister died, um, uh, was it uh, cholera? I can't remember, but, but it was a disease of some sort. And so she ends up with an uncle who only beats her every so often. Uh, and, and so there's so many things that are addressed in the book. Um, uh, and and we, we get to learn about like, you know, this historical event in mining, but also its impact on families and women. I think it's important that it, the book is called The Women of the Copper Country, right? It's not just one individual woman. Sean, could you talk some more about these women's bonds and, and even crossing um, ethnic boundaries, cultural boundaries, how they manage to come together in the novel? There's a, one of the interesting moments. So I, have, I had a, more than one student um, wrote about uh, their own experiences of misogyny in their own cultures and when, when they read the book. And one of the moments that most inspired them or impacted them was there's a, there's a moment when, uh, oh, it's Annie's first husband's name. Joe. Uh, Joe, yeah, Joe, Joe and Annie re recreate um, a cultural dance from Slovenia that's uh, mm -hmm. like a, it's a wedding dance. And the dance itself is um, indicative of power differentials between, between men and women you know, the, the, the way that the dance plays out. And so recognizing that, that inside, you know, cultural value systems are already were embedded these, these really tough to break um, uh, patriarchal uh, power imbalances. How did they break it? Well, so you see, like I told you, one of my most fascinating, one of the places I'm most fascinated in the book is the Mother Jones heart to heart with Annie. Mm -hmm. Like when do the women work with each other 
to be able to um, figure out strategies for dealing with this. The, the, the Charlie moment when, when Charlie, the labor union leader, tries to figure out how to relate to women, it completely and awkwardly fails. <laughs> like he has no idea how to talk to women, right? But they know how to talk to each other, and in the, their ability to talk to each other is what makes the strike actually go, the power of that. So. Dr. Seward, um, do the tunnels under the lake from the mine still exist, or have they all collapsed? That's a very good question. <laughs> I, was, I saw this question pop up. I know there are some mine tours up there, but I know I would imagine they're filled with water because the pumps haven't been running. So that would be my guess. I and mean, in terms of the actual collapses or not, I do not know that answer and I won't make it up. <laughs> Professor Nagel, which characters' perspectives really opened your eyes about the history from this time period? Is there anybody that surprised you? Well, that's a great question. Um, the thing that really drew me this was was really the immigrant experience, and so I, in in a way, it's it's like um, McNaughton's frustration and anger and his disturbing thoughts and comments about immigrants. Um, that was one of the things that I really uh, liked about it. Um, uh, and the fact that uh, it was representative of so many people in that era. And, and when I was reading it um, for the first time, uh, there was a lot of uh, um, current events dealing with immigrants um, and whether or not we should build a wall uh, on the Mexican border. Um, and, so, um, and so that was something that, that struck me there. Um, I mean, there's so many like Woodbridge Ferris you know, uh, from Ferris uh, State University, a uh, real figure. He was a, a gubernatorial, well, served as governor, um, had, you know, influenced by the, uh, the progressive movement and that, um, you know, and, and how he's, I think that she uh, made him a little bit, a little bit nicer uh, than he was, but, but really he, he did have many of those positive qualities, at least pro-labor uh, inclinations on his part. And I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that his wife was an invalid um, and he did end up marrying. There's some hints about um, his secretary and him. Um, after his wife passed away, um, uh, he did marry the, uh, the secretary. So I don't know if that answers the question directly, but but that's kind of maybe the best way I can you know answer. There, there was there's a, so many great ones. So, yeah. Sean, are you familiar with the book Uprising? We have a question about whether or not maybe Russell was inspired by that book. I'm not familiar with that one. Do you know it? I, I don't know it, um, but I, I, can, I can say something about uh, the way that the Great, the great Michigan Read um, treated uh, Upper Peninsula books because, so I, I would guess that, that it's true that she would have done enough research that she would have read other books like Uprising. I have not read that book myself, so I don't know the, the parallel, but it's a kind of a cool idea. But I do know that, that, so for the entire history of the Great Michigan Read, the Upper Peninsula has been fighting to get an Upper Peninsula book recognized <laughs> as the Great Michigan Read. And that another book about the copper mine strike called um, Red Jacket, which is I think the original name of Calumet, that was a novel that was pushed pretty hard, but it didn't succeed. And I think the reason that Mary's book does is that the history and the literary quality of it are equally important. They're, they're balanced in this book and that makes it go. So I don't know if Uprising is a, is a similar novel, but the thing that made this one work is that the literary quality of it made it successful. So, so that's a perfect time to bring in a, a quote I've just been holding in reserve um, to use, thanks, thanks Sean, um, from Russell herself about what she intended to do in writing this novel. She says, the copper strike itself has been studied and written about by historians and legal experts, but those accounts are not meant to engage the reader's emotions. That was my job to combine imagination and empathy with research. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about and why, why this book is so compelling. It does have a lot of historical accuracy, but it's designed to invoke our emotions, to evoke our emotions. Yep, I think that, that's exactly right. That's, that, and that's, if you can sympathetically relate to the characters, then you also sympathetically relate to the history. And so it's a way to you know, smuggle the history in. So. One thing that kind of bothered me, but I think was realistic was when Big Annie was in jail and she had the 15 year old prostitute as her jailmate. And then there was also the opium 
down the hall. I mean, that seemed very similar to what could be happening today. You know, and I don't know if she, I know there was some of the drug abuse back then, but perhaps Mike or Sean could. Uh, yeah, you know, um, uh, some drug abuse uh, uh, and, and, you know, sex, the sex industry, uh, it might be the oldest profession in the world. Um, so, uh, as many people would say, so the fact that she um, uh, provides a story for this sex worker, okay, um, and humanizes this uh, person in this industry that's usually, you know, uh, 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 where women are, who are involved in this um, are often uh, portrayed very negatively. This whole story about how she's providing for her family uh, and um, and she's really forced into this. And then, you know, one of the only escapes uh, would be uh, drugs and alcohol. Uh, and then and in that case, opium. So I don't know anything about percentages, uh, but but I do know that that uh, abuse like that, you know, is accurate. That that abuse in the prison scene is pretty terrifying. It's hard to read. And it, and it, and it triggered one of my students to write an essay specifically to look at the question about whether we aren't seeing or understanding or recognizing or aware of um, problems in our criminal justice system that might have that kind of ramification. And it, it's interesting that in his research, he found that there's actually a prison in the UP where there's, you know, um, there, were viol there was enough violence and sub enough concern that it raised a level of journalism. So people did investigative journalism there. So he, he wondered that same thing, like, is this, what, how, do we, how do we deal with this, right? And so he, he looked into it and thought, okay, how do we then become aware of crim problems in our own criminal justice system now, now that we've been inspired by the novel? Okay, to all of you, we have a few more questions. Do you think the person who shouted fire did so on purpose with the intent on harming people or that it really was just an accident? Yeah, um, they, they, there have been investigations, to, there were investigations to try to determine who this person was and what actually was said. And um, that's, they, that continues to be a mystery. Uh, and you know, there were several people who said, oh, we saw someone with, a, with that Citizens Alliance button uh, who did this. Um, you know, it, it was, I found it interesting the way that uh, Russell uh, chose to portray that, that it, this was just kind of an accident or, or you know, he didn't do it. There wasn't a malicious intent necessarily, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting the way that she handled it. And they still don't know for sure. Uh, and I don't know if people read the author's note at the end, but um, uh, the Supreme Court Justice, I think it was Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, who said, you know, you can't just yell fire in a crowded uh, theater. Uh, and, and, you know, there's limits to free speech. Uh, and, and so, and he was thinking of that as inspiration, apparently. It's another example of the power of folk music because the Woody Guthrie song about the 1913 strike, um, makes the implication that it was done on purpose. And so he, obviously Woody Guthrie is a towering figure in folk music and had an influence on popular culture. And so part of our perception is shaped by the music in that case. I'm not gonna sing that one. <clears throat> Professor Nagel, do you think the Italian Hull disaster influenced the president to recognize unions and the right to strike? Yeah, so um, it influences the, the labor movement. The first president who really kind of uh, gave uh, labor a fair shake was Teddy Roosevelt. He wasn't necessarily a friend to labor, but he recognized uh, that unions should be uh, 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 should be well that owners should recognize um, unions and, and at least have conversations and, and mediate with them. It was really not until the 1930s that you see labor uh, um, uh, Congress passing legislation that enables or facilitates labor more. So. Um, it's, it's on its way, and this was one of many things. Uh, something that also happened in about this era uh, was the Triangle Shirt Factory Fire, which was a, a, a building um, in New York where they were uh, making shirts, and um, that led to several regulations on uh, workplace safety. Uh, and so the combining those helps to provide some momentum to the labor movement. But what basically happens right after this is World War I. And, and the, the country's, um, uh, you know, distracted by that. And so labor takes a bit of a backseat for a while. So good question. All right, do we have any additional questions? Oh, 
just some extra context there about the book uprising that 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 is about the triangle shirt waist factory. I, I knew that I I, I had you heard of it. Name. <laughs> yeah, but I I couldn't remember exactly um, uh, the focus of it, but I do remember um, uh, that book. Yeah. Anything else from the panelists that you'd like to share? No, thank you. This is fun for me. I this was a blast. Thank you all so very much. So if anyone is interested in continuing your exploration of movement, we have several upcoming events for you to choose from, from humankind. Currently, Annie Holmes' art exhibit, Can't See the Forest for the Trees, is running through this Friday at the Old Kirk Museum in Manistee. And you'll find a full listing of humankind events by visiting West Shore's website. Once you've arrived there, click on community on the drop-down menu. And before you go, I have a favor to ask. When you exit this session, a survey will pop up. Would you please take it and give us your feedback? It helps us to plan future events and improve um, the viewer experience for humankind. So again, panelists, awesome job. What a great discussion. What a wonderful way to really get to know a book and uh, to recognize our common humanity and the ability of a single person to influence others. So thank you. Have a great night, everyone.